Hello and welcome to our LinkedIn Live session. My name is Alicia Hegarty. I am the Associate Director and Wellness Lead at CPL's Future of Work Institute. And I'm delighted to host the second installment of our Future of Wellness series. Future of Wellness is a key service delivered through our Future of Work Institute, providing enterprise level health, safety and wellness solutions to our clients. And today I am delighted to be joined by my friend, colleague and partner Shahini Day, CEO of MPL, a digital health company providing data driven wellbeing solutions. Shahini set up MPL in 2018 after a whopping 22 years working in global equity investments. And Shahini is a true believer in innovative data-driven solutions like myself. So welcome Shahini. Thank you very much, Alicia. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks very much for giving us oh, the opportunity. Exciting. And, uh, yeah, delighted to have you here. And we're truly also excited to have Ampeel as our technology partner for our future of wellness services. And we feel that there's a really strong role for technology and data to contribute to uh, the evolution of workplace wellness um, for all organizations. So it's a really exciting time, I think, for wellness uh, technology as well. Yeah, yeah. I should also say, if you have any questions for either myself or Shahini, please post them below and we'll hopefully be able to answer them towards the end. Um, Shahini, I'm sure you'll agree the last year has seen employee wellbeing catapult forward. It's on the agenda of most organizations now and wellness technology will have a really big role to play. What benefit has wellness technology had for organizations and where do you see its role in the future? Yeah, very, very interesting question. And indeed, like we have seen last year, bring health and digitization to the forefront of everybody's mind. And organizations started looking for ways to help employees who were new to working from home. Uh, the transition was so drastic that after the initial shock, when people realized that this is going to be the way forward in the foreseeable future, um, they all embraced digital solutions. Um, however, what happened was a lot of programs moved from ad hoc on-site programs to ad hoc Zoom sessions, so which worked well uh, for some time, but then the Zoom fatigue, as you know, um, saw the engagement levels fall. Um, also, um, there was a, the lack of structured data-driven programs considering the organization and its employees' needs are still an issue. And a majority of clients we talk to actually are looking to implement the data-driven approach, but they don't know where to start. And I'm sure uh, during our many conversation uh, between ourselves, uh, I'm sure you are looking at the same uh, issues and you're seeing the same in the market. Now, uh, wellness technologies actually can become a game changer for organizations, particularly in this new normal of remote or hybrid working, you know. Um, on one hand, it can help with employee engagement in a world where uh, water cooler chats are a thing of the past. Um, on the other hand, it can actually give employees access to health and well-being solutions that they need when they need and in total privacy. And mm. the aggregated data analytics can also help companies understand the strategic um, importance and strategize the organization and its workforce needs. And this, I believe, will save time and money uh, while improving, uh, improving employee satisfaction as well. Mm. Um, or, uh, I mean, however, in, like any other corporate wellbeing solutions approach, you know, Alicia, uh, this will have to be driven from the top and embraced by everyone in the organization. Um, the management need to understand the, its strategic importance. And some might actually, there's, I know we have discussed this, uh, it might be beneficial to actually include it in the performance measurement metrics as well. And this cannot happen without a data-driven approach, you know. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and lastly, I think most important thing to understand is any implementation of wellness technology solution will have to be looked at in a similar fashion as uh, when you're rolling out any business solution like an SAP or a Salesforce. So you just cannot expect it to happen overnight or on its own. It definitely needs internal commitment, a lot mm -hmm. of training and proper implementation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I agree. And I think that's one of the ways that I feel a strategic approach to wellness works really, really well. Too often we see organizations, you know, rolling it out without a plan, uh, crossing their fingers and then wondering why people aren't uh, engaging in it. So I completely agree with what you said there. And speaking of engagement, you know, I know there is some controversy out there about technology. On one hand, we see stats that say employees don't engage in it, don't bother. And then in others, they get great engagement. What are you seeing in this regard? What kind of engagement ratios are you seeing amongst your users? Yeah, you see, I totally agree with you there with the engagement piece. And it is an issue. Um, and it has actually been an issue for any uh, wellness um, uh, programs, even before technology became prominent. You know, when we were doing our initial research back in 2018, a uh, global average of engagement of these programs were only about five to seven percent. So that that's shocking uh, numbers. But there are a few things at play here, right? Um, with MPL, thankfully, we have achieved a good results in terms of like we have 60 to 80 percent engagement, 50 wow. percent of our users. Yeah, 50 percent of our users achieve their goals. And in just even one month, we have seen activity, sleep, stress score improvement. And we believe that uh, we could achieve that because uh, MPL helps organizations understand their workforce needs better and deliver relevant customized solutions to users. Um, we need to remember one size fits all solutions don't work. And uh, as you always say as well, like more customized the solution, more people will engage, you know. Um, and the second very, very important thing, I think it, that comes up every single time is data privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to make sure data privacy is maintained at the very core of the solution. Users of these technologies will have to be reassured that there's no way personal data will be shared with anyone. And when we talk to the users, actually, users, organizations, m most of the time, data privacy is the first question we are asked. And, you know, we are working together with few clients and every time you've seen how important the DPO uh, um, is putting uh, importance on the data privacy, we've signed the DPIAs and you know how much background work that goes in there. So we always reiterate how important data privacy is to us and not only to us, but also how our technology is built to safeguard that data privacy. So it's very important. And lastly, as I mentioned just now, rolling out these solutions need commitment of everyone in the organization. So embracing these solutions have to be driven by the organization culture. Only then we can achieve the desired engagement. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think what you said around the, the privacy and the data privacy is really important for reassuring the organization and also for reassuring the, the user, the employee as well. So I think that's that's really key. And as you say, you know, how you roll it out really does impact the, the levels of engagement that you get as well as the culture within an organization. So like anything, it needs its own project plan with milestones and key stakeholders to help drive mm -hmm. that engagement. And I think sometimes that's where companies fall short, where they just roll it out and kind of cross their, cross their fingers and such. <laughs> Um, yeah. And we've been working on some exciting projects uh, together with some of our clients, and we're certainly seeing more and more uptake in utilizing data when it comes to health and well-being. And I'm, you know me, I'm, I'm really strong on utilizing the data. It, 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 I get excited when I see data. Why do you think it's important for CEOs to take, you know, health and wellness data seriously? 
Yeah, I mean, you and me are on the same boat, like uh, just given my history of my work, what I've been doing, I, I just love data as well, uh, you know. Um, and uh, uh, we as the MPL team, we are really enjoying working with you and your team as well in uh, Future of Work in CPL. Um, so there are several uh, benefits of having this data approach, Alicia. Um, as I mentioned before, it helps in strategizing employee health and well-being programs, which in turn gives access to relevant services uh, for that particular organization and its employee base. Um, so what happens is this helps in employee engagement, but also it helps in attraction and retention of talent because you're giving mm -hmm. employees what they want and what they need and at the right time. And also, this this will also help in reducing unnecessary cost on programs, you know, uh, that are not seeing enough traction or not getting the desired results. It's, as you said, like hoping for the best. It doesn't have to be hoping for the best. Um, the second thing is in some geographical regions, like we work in multiple geographical regions, um, healthier and happier employees means better insurance premiums as well, where you can actually negotiate the premiums. Um, and generally the uh, health insurance are provided by the organizations. Uh, so that's a cost saving. But in other regions, uh, a data-driven approach can help in negotiating the right group health insurance packages. Uh, just to give you an example, we had one client uh, where we realized that there were a lot of uh, posture issues uh, within the sedentary workforce. Uh, so what they did was they not only brought in the workplace assessments and stuff, but also the company negotiated more physio visit reimbursements versus GP visit reimbursements for from its health insurers for its employees. So that's also very critical um, for what you are giving employees access to. Um, and then as at an employee level, if you're looking at uh, uh, in employee level, um, it is all about health outcomes. You know, most programs are generic and only the most motivated takes part in these programs generally. Um, so to have a more inclusive and highly engaging suite of services, it has to be personalized and easy to access and continuous improvement of health with real time interventions are not possible without the help of data. So we all know like happy and healthy employees can uh, mean more productive and enthusiastic workforce. Um, if you want to put some numbers around it, uh, For Frost and Sullivan um, did a survey um, and they actually did a, did a very detailed report where they showed that every $1 spent on employee well-being can generate an ROI of $6. However, this ROI can increase to 14 to $16 per dollar spent as the solution gets more focused towards health outcomes. So that's why it's very, very important. Um, and lastly, I would say that because it's very early days of digitization, um, majority of organizations we are seeing are using various platforms for remote access of these services and they're not integrated onto one platform. Yeah. As a result, there is uh, it is very difficult to get data-driven insights which helps in strategic decision making. And so you can say that using data and technology for employee health and well-being solution is no more a good to have option, but it is mm -hmm. an important option yeah. important uh, yeah solution. yeah for sure yeah and even in our analysis as well we've seen um improvements in as we say health outcomes in absenteeism rates and productivity scores uh, so as you say around the return on investment there's also that return on value as well and some organizations mm -hmm. using it to boost their employer value proposition for attraction retention is improved so there's so many things that when you have the right systems in place you can utilize that data for as well and i get really excited about helping organizations use this data to really tailor their interventions so when you're building out your wellness strategy as you say it's completely customized um to to the employee and their needs before we move to our q a um and i know you've mentioned already one of the key uniquenesses about the mpl platform is that obviously it's you know it's everything under one roof tell us um what are the key things that make mpl unique yeah um i mean first of all i have to say um 
uh, everything under one roof. You guys actually told us that that was one of the biggest benefits you think that MPL technology mm. has. Um, some other partners have talked about uh, it's not only the assessments or the content, but actually uh, understanding that there's somebody at the end of the line, the actual person who they can speak to. So combination of those two. Um, so all our kind of USPs, we uh, why MPL is unique, uh, comes from our clients and partners, what they tell us. Um, uh, so like, look, MP, like any other employee well-being technologies, provides all those. Like there are a lot of good solutions, you know, in this market where um, it's gamified, the incentivization, assessments, access to experts, as I said. Um, but where we differ is that, first of all, it's very easy to roll out. No organizations, neither their employees, want to have a complicated system as life is busy anyways, you know. So we made sure that our rollout takes the least headspace uh, for everyone concerned. Um, next is, uh, which is also a big, uh, big thing which we thought about when we were designing it, uh, because we always designed the platform on a co-creation model with the uh, users and clients. Um, so MPL is a fully customizable platform and uh, to, see, to suit the need of the organization and employees. It can deliver a variety of health and well-being programs all under one roof. So for example, it can deliver clinical solutions around physical health and me uh, mental health, um, and also ac like access nutritionists, uh, clinical psychologists, uh, fitness trainers, medical doctors, but also interestingly, it can also give you access to chefs, makeup artists, stylists. So this is all, literally all under one roof. It also gives organizations abilities to run social clubs like photography clubs, book clubs, etc. And that we actually saw very good take up in the last year when uh, people were working remotely. Uh, the customization theme is also incorporated in dashboards. So any MI dashboards can be customized because every organization is different. Um, and assessments are also customized to give you a better understanding of the health and well-being status and needs of those organizations. Um, lastly, I think most importantly, MPL keeps user experience at the core. So we minimize data entry. Um, it, MPL is integrated with variable uh, various wearables, so uh, users don't have to buy any particular device. Whatever they have can sync uh, with MPL. Uh, we also in integrate with other th third-party solutions so that we can give you 360-degree view of health. Um, and this actually helps us deliver that personalized programs and content uh, to users. Yeah, I think, you know, that's that's fantastic. And like I said before, I think having the one solution under one roof is is very important um, for, I think, employers. I've seen organizations that are trying to customize something for their businesses and they're using, you know, one platform for their EAP, one platform for their health screening, one platform for coaching, another platform for education or training. And it's, yeah. it's, it's cumbersome, you know? So for yeah. sure, having it in one, um, one key, um, uh, uh, platform it really relieves a lot of that burden for employers as well. So I think we have a couple of questions. Oh, go on. Sorry. No, no go, on, just, go on. Also, when you are using multiple platforms, you know, when you are talking about data-driven decision making, it's impossible to integrate all that data under one roof. You need another system to do that. You know, so yeah, you yes. yeah, you don't want to kind of go in, uh, go and use different uh, platforms. Exactly, exactly. So one question we're seeing: uh, Do you think that blockchain technology for data protection and traceability might have a future prominent role in these areas? Just don't know what your thoughts are on, on that, Shahini. Um, absolutely. I mean, look, I'm not a technical person at all. So I will not go into any technical discussion here. However, uh, just to give you an idea, we actually have a partner 
um, who is a blockchain technology partner. And uh, that's a different project we work uh, we are working on. It's a community led project. And that's exactly uh, what are, we are working with on them on data protection, traceability, and also tokenizing, as I said, MPL is a gamified platform, tokenizing those uh, point systems to integrate with community um, uh, reward system like GA tickets and all that. But that needs a huge amount of data protection um, work. And we, we are actually working with one of the partners are blockchain technology as well. Interesting, interesting. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that senior management are so reluctant to embrace workplace well-being? We've mentioned the value of data, stacks, cost saving, but does that mean senior management have some special way of taking care of their health if they don't recognize the benefits to their staff? There's a, there's a, there's a lot there. There's embracing kind of workplace well-being, but then also, um, you know, your own well-being. And I think there's both. I think mm. obviously we need to lead by example. Um, from my personal experience, and, on, and I'll get your opinion now in a, in a, in a sec as well, uh, Shahini, but from my personal um, opinion and, and from the research that we're seeing is that uh, leaders are going to really drive the future. They're going to be relied upon more heavily to drive the future of wellness, to drive the engagement and onboarding. And we will, I think, see it implemented into more policies and procedures and one-to-one -one and performance management that needs to be driven by leadership. At the moment, we are seeing a lot of HR professionals who are, like I said in the last session, trying to herd sheep to get people to engage. It needs leadership engagement, but equally leaders need to also look after themselves. But do you have any thoughts on that as well, Shahini? Yeah, I think you are the best place to answer this question, but what we are seeing as well, companies where we have top-down um, approach uh, uh, like it's driven from the top not top down approach but driven from the top that i uh, this is actually within the organization culture and mm. that's where you you get a demand pull from the employee side as well as well as uh the top the, uh, top level management engaging and you get way more um engagement there and like if the employees are asking for it um then the management will the senior management will turn around and say that yeah this is what they need and this is what we need to do like you know it becomes very Im important and they do embrace the workplace well-being uh yeah. in those cases if it's not and, and we have all sorts of things uh, all sorts of companies as you know as well i'm sure you are seeing it as well wherever there is uh engagement it's in the uh, company culture there's way more uh embracing of the workplace well-being programs whereas when there isn't it's yeah. very very difficult it is like it becomes like herding cattle yeah exactly and, and thanks adrian for your, for your question and i know he kind of mentioned around you know the value of the stats and the data and the cost savings at an organizational level um, more at a management level we're talking more around the value the the return on value so driving that productivity that engagement you know keeping people engaged and happy and healthy and wanting to kind of come to work at the benefits at that kind of level so they'll filter down as you kind of roll roll out your your wellness program and, and, and engage people so that's fantastic we're coming to the end we're you know um this we could probably talk on this for for Eri shahini yeah. but i'd love you know just to summarize just to finish up what's your one kind of final piece of advice for someone thinking about implementing wellness technology into their organization yeah i would say look at the long-term uh prospect of it like don't expect something to happen in the next week um this is a this is a solution for the long term and you need that full commitment to the long-term uh, aspect of it. You need to be ready to engage. You need to understand that there will be, like any, as I said again bef before, uh, if you're implement, if you're rolling out, say an Oracle system or an SAP system, you need to get your internal um, champions ready. You need to get them trained. You need to buy into it from the, from the organization culture level um and give give it time and uh give 
give the long term, give it, give it a long term perspective, and also, um, um, sorry, it, it just, uh, yeah, just long term uh, organizational structure and um, um, and go for it. And sorry, the one thing I was forgetting is the customization and don't go for one size fits all it has to be your what makes sense for you yeah yeah exactly exactly thank you so much for your time today shahini um i'm really excited about this collaboration and where the future of wellness is going yeah thank you very much alicia uh we love working with you and uh, we well, uh, we love that uh, our wavelength are on the same Yes. Um, yeah, say the same path. And uh, thank you very much for having me over today. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay.